I, I think we are just going to still I'm either I'm going to switch back and forth. Yeah. Okay, no problem. So you guys can see the slides now, right? Yep, we can see the slides and we can see you at the bottom, which is which is okay. nice. That's good enough. I can't see you guys, but I yep. have to look that. Let, let me tell you something, Steve. Can you move um, a little, like four inches to your left? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. Perfect. So, so if we get forward looking at your slides uh, and, and you get going, every once in a while I'll show it on you. Um, okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Steve, can you count to ten? Do a sound check. Can I do a sound check? Yeah. One, two, three, four, eight, twelve, sixty-two, nine, three point one four one five nine two six five four. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Oh yeah. Um. Good. I think we're uh, we're ready to roll. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm going to give them the quiz first. Okay, Steve. Sure. Because they they love it. They love quizzes. Yeah. They they beg me for quizzes. Didn't we all put them on Okay, guys. So. Here we go, quiz number three. I think I have just four questions. Uh, is Z coming? Is the only one we're missing. It's only 2.31, actually. Let's just vamp for two minutes. Uh, Steve, you know, uh, just just um, to mention this, uh, Wes uh, here, one of our students, he wasn't here last time, actually. He's the only one who wasn't, who wasn't here. Um, so Wes, you can wave your hand. Uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, was asking about immigration. You know, European immigration. Have you been following that, Dr. Demarath? What do you think about that, and so on? And, um, I was talking about how. Uh, well, I said, yeah, it's historic. I said, yeah, it really is. And, and I said, but you know, these things do happen periodically with some regularity, where you get a flood of people. You know, and. Right. And, and I was thinking, it's sort of like floods that happen in uh, in society and in uh, in rivers that that neutrify the floodplain, um, providing uh, cheap labor that uh, that was lacking, or you know, motivated people if there's a sort of stagnant society. Uh, if they're moving in. So you know, it's, it relates to complexity, and it just got me thinking about that. All right, so uh, I, think we're, I think we're good to go. Anybody late? This is just the penalty. Missing the quiz. OK, here we go. Quiz number three. Question number one. At one point, we read about a program where cells can be born and die called, Steve, you can't see this, right? So A, life, B, D, N, apples, C, seed to soil, D, helix. One of the characteristics we read about was a temperature, B pressure, C neighborhoods, <coughs> D decay rate. We mainly read today about A CAs, cover your answers as you go, please. B processing, C randomness, D recycling. Towards the end of the reading for today, we saw how to convert a decimal number into one of those. A, a set of initial conditions. B, a rate of entropy. C, binary number. D, a model's iteration number. That's it. What's that? Only four. That's it. That's all I got. 
See, this is actually the research shows this is why women women tend to be women. To, Steve's bored. He's listening to YouTube while we while we do the quiz. Um, why women tend to do worse on multiple choice than men? They're more likely to be self-critical, which I think is a healthy habit, right? I'm not arrogant and thinking that you're right all the time, but you can think yourself out of the right question. Anyway, okay, question number one. At one point, we read about a program where cells are born and die called A, life. One of the characteristic characteristics <coughs> we read about was neighborhoods, C. We mainly read today about CAs, A. Towards the end of the reading for today, we saw how to convert a decimal number into a binary number. Yeah, C. Yeah, that was a pretty cool trick there. Um, Okay, so good guys. We, we, we don't ask that you understand everything necessarily, you know, but that's why we're here in class. But, uh, but we do ask that you do the reading. So good for you. You're getting credit. Um, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay, just to let you know, I'm not hearing you really clearly right now. Okay. That better. You sound better now. Oh really? Okay. Maybe that's because I just went to to Skype. So now, now, now we're not seeing your slides at this point. We're just seeing me. You're seeing you? Yeah, we're not seeing. Oh wait a minute. If I go, can you go down there and maybe I do that? I think if you go, yeah, I'm I'm just seeing me. Okay, hold on. If you go down there and you see the bottom where it says your 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 PowerPoint at the bottom of your bar there? Yeah. On the, on the bottom uh, yeah, I'm left? Yeah, I'm just talking to people first. So they're, they're seeing you, not me. That's right. They're, 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 well, they're, saying, they're seeing us in the classroom, but they're seeing you at the very bottom, your face at the very bottom. But we're not seeing your slideshow yet. All right, well, I'll, I'll start the slide. There we go. There we go. There we go. Like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, slide. Okay, just I thought initially I, I if anybody had any questions from last time. Okay, questions from last time, anybody? I'll I'll ask one. Okay. Unless you guys want to ask one. I just didn't understand that. I didn't pay tuition, you did, huh? I didn't understand that entire thing, so Okay, well that was a big did you hear her say that? <laughs> no, I didn't. Well she said but to her credit, the first thing she said when she, Maddie, when she walked into class today was that she went back and she spent four hours going over the, the PowerPoint from last class because she really didn't understand it. Um, okay. So, you know, uh, but do you understand a little better now? I understand the first half, but where I stopped at was like the bunny aisle. So that yeah, she stopped at the bunny aisle. That's where I started at the Bunny Isle I, when I went back over it, because I... The so Bunny Isle messed you up? Well, I, I I was trying to figure out what it was we were plotting there. Um, okay, let me go through that then. Okay. Last time we had that equation called the logistic map. Yeah. And who cares what it is? It has one parameter in it, r. If you change the value of r, you're basically changing, if you will, the rate at which the bunnies are born, so the growth rate. Mm -hmm. But that other term always reacts to the, if the bunnies are reproducing rapidly, they also have to run the risk of dying off rapidly. Yeah. Through that other term. So when you saw those pictures I drew, what they were was the population density. So x, the value of x, which is between 0 and 1. Remember, 0 means extinction. 1 means 100% of the most bunnies this island could support. Right. 
okay? So what you were looking at was how that value changed with time, the horizontal axis of time. So if it went to a fixed point, that meant it grew up, but then it just slowly settled into a certain value and never changed. That's what a fixed point is, it's a steady state value. And, and I, but I keep thinking of that fixed point being, I guess, the population relative to the environment, which is x. It's, but that's not quite is. what it is, right? That's not what we're no, plotting. That is what oh, it that is. is what we're plotting. It's the value of x that it goes to. So if, if that line settles off at a value of x equals 0.5, that means the population of the bunnies are at 50% of their maximum population. Right. Now, if you increase the value of r, eventually you'll start to see a cycle. Yeah. What that means is, let's say, let's, let's just suppose we're measuring the population once every mating season, okay? So one mating season, it has a certain value. The next mating season has a different value. Right. And the one after that, it returns to its original value. So it oscillates back and forth between two different populations. Mm -hmm. And I think the slide I gave you was a four cycle, which meant it was oscillating between four populations. So it went, you know, 0.5, 0.8, 0.3, 0.2, 0.5, 0.8, 0.3, 0.2, 0.5, 0.8, 0.3, 0.2, 0.5, 0.8, 0.3, 0.2, 0.5, 0.8, 0.3, 0.
was fluctuating. Yeah, because we don't have sort of, well, I was going to say the measures to be sensitive enough to account for it, or? Um, yeah, that, that's exactly it. We can't track all the effects right. on the island. Now, obviously, the bunnies can't, you know, this is, this is a, a mathematical model. There would be a well-defined number of rabbits at any point in time. The carrying capacity is also a well-defined number of rabbits. So that the ratio of the rabbits we have to the rabbits we could support will always be a rational number. However, given the nature of the mathematical model, we allow any real number just be stuck in there. Mm -hmm. And that's when we get fooled. Because it turns out if it's actually one of the irrational numbers, then this thing will behave in an erratic fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, this starts to become a realistic problem for real ecosystems because there are aspects of those ecosystems that really will depend on properties of systems that are you know, true honest to God real numbers and they can have any value whatsoever. And that's when these systems start to go chaotic. In principle, we could stop this system from being chaotic by really only including values of x that were rational. In other words, there were a ratio of two integers. The problem is this model has no way of really incorporating that. X is what it is. So it was very confusing to people. They thought, well, this can't really matter, you know, if a ratio is exactly two thirds, point six 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 six, or if it goes point six 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 eight, that wasn't going to make any difference. The answer was yes, it does eventually. So it's sort of like you start measuring the air from butterfly wings. You start getting that specific, and that introduces irrational numbers in effect because it's so uh, yeah. detailed. Yeah. Okay. It basically is. See, eventually, it should end up, but the problem is, eventually, small effects yep. between the environment outside the island and the island start to become important. Yeah. You, if you can't separate your system from its surroundings, remember, I warned you about this. Yes. Then yes. you can't describe things completely because you can't track everything. Right. And it turns out that chaotic systems are so sensitive that eventually anything you neglect from the environment will start to come back and bite you. Yep. Okay, well, that's great. I, I'm, I'm clearer on it. And that, that sets me up to help you guys when we review this. I think I'll be able to sort of lead us through it um, when, we, when we get to that point. Why don't we, unless you guys want to push this discussion forward, why don't we sort of move on to... <coughs> to uh, cellular autonomy, uh, automata, how do we say it? Automata. 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 Yeah. Okay. okay well, here, by the way, is a nice entry, this, this is the URL, for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and they have a nice description of cellular automata in there, so if you want to refer to that later, you can go look it up. Um, cellular automata is, well, go, but let's talk this way first. Um, so what we're going to do now is move from a system where we're looking at a single state variable like x or a couple of state variables like x and w. Now we're going to start looking at a system that has a lot of state variables. And typically why it would have a lot of state variables is because it has a lot of individual objects in it. So rather than looking at one particle, we'll look at a bunch of particles. Rather than look at an ant, we'll look at a colony of ants. But rather than just worry about their population, we're going to worry about each individual ant. Okay, and to use the actual term, these are called many body systems. Whereas if you've got one pendulum going back and forth, that's a few body systems. Okay, it's only one or two things, but <coughs> many body systems, by definition, many is huge. How huge? unlimited, okay, it's as large as it has to be. So for example, again, my example here is a colony of ants or neurons in the brain, okay, so you have, you know, trillions of neurons, you have, you know, a colony of ants could be any 
shy if you want. Uh, they always seem bigger in Texas. Um, okay, uh, now the state of the system, again, is the complete description of the system, but now, notice how complicated that, this, that, that state description is. Because you have to tell me what every individual is doing. If you have a trillion individuals, you suddenly have at least a trillion state variables. And that gets really hard to manage. Um, further, you have this, um, we start to make a distinction, I'm just giving you a hint of something that's coming, between different kinds of state descriptions. If I were to describe what every state is doing, what every individual in the state is doing, sometimes that is called a microstate description. You're describing the system at the microscopic level, at the level of the individual. On the other hand, if I simply said 40% of my individuals are doing this, that kind of description is called a macrostate description. It just says something about the entire collection, but it, it's missing a lot of information to precisely specify what the system is doing. So that's just a hint of some uh, phrasing we're going to use. Um, now, is it worth the same as before? Okay, we're going to have a state, describe a state of the system, and we're going to have a rule for how, well, it's not a key rule, it's going to be a rule to find out the reason. It's just going to be another set of rules to show you how to obtain. Now, you may want to picture this having in your mind. This is one way to look at it would be a, a, che a checkerboard. You have a checkerboard in each square, either had a checker on it or not. Okay? then the state of that system would be to go through all 64 spaces and tell me if you had a checker on it. Now, if we use a one and a zero, one being yes, there's a checker, zero being no, there isn't a checker, you would have 60, a string of 64 ones and zeros. Okay, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, zero, zero. That's what a state of that checkerboard would look like. Especially if you simply define a way to go through every square and paint a number on each, you could tell me the state of the game by simply telling me a series of ones and zeros. And how that system changed with time would be literally how the pieces moved from step to step. Now, obviously, if a person, if two people are playing the game, we don't understand the quote-unquote rules for time evolution. We may understand the rules for checkers, but we don't know what each player is going to do because we're dealing with agents that have free will. Instead here, we're going to think of two computer programs controlling the checkers according to a well-defined set of rules. So it's going to be like, gee, if my checker has <coughs> three adjacent squares that are full, this is what will happen next time. So we'll go through this in more detail, but let me say a few words in general. Um, one of the things we're looking for, because these are truly complex systems now, Okay, they have many, many pieces. So there are some things we've observed about complex systems. One of them is self-organization. Okay, you may start off with randomness, but little structures suddenly appear that look organized, and you can't quite figure out how they got there in the first place. They just sort of emerge. In other words, they self-organize. Emergent properties. Emergent properties are literally a property of the system as a whole that is very difficult to locate in any single piece. So here's a great example of that. Does anybody have an issue with water being wet? You know what that means, right? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Try now to look at the properties of an individual water molecule and explain to me where wet comes from. Right. That's an emergent property. An emergent <coughs> property, wetness is a property of a huge collection of water molecules, not of an individual water molecule. So that's a good example. Mm -hmm. Or, or sorry, way. Steve, but I'm just thinking, you know, an immigrant versus immigration. And it, you know, an immigration issue. It becomes an issue when it it seems to reach a, a critical point, right? Sorry to be the sociologist and jump into the social like that, but... No, no, but that's okay. If you can think of a property, for example, uh, I think of a good one, we're, we're in the middle of um, you know, a presidential campaign. People will make generalized statements about people coming over the border from Mexico into the United States. 
clearly that applies to the group as a whole. It doesn't tell you necessarily anything about any individual member of that. Right, right. So these emergent properties of what happens when the whole group does something, not necessarily when one person does something. And I think I just want to say this is why sociologists and social scientists in general are so interested in this kind of language. And you'll meet Dante Suarez, <coughs> uh, Suarez from Japan, who's in Japan on sabbatical right now. I don't know if he'll be getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning to talk to us, but uh, um, economists are interested in this too, and it's because we're talking about the patterns of the group, but not the individual. So I can talk about women all day long, but I'm not talking about any of the women in this class, or gender, when I'm talking about men, I'm not talking about any of us men in the class, and it's properties of the, uh, properties of that, well, social structure, we would often say, that we're referring to. But anyway, I just want to, saying amen is the importance of this, so. Um, now, there's a few other words you may hear from me when fat tail behavior. No, this is not some kind of fat shaming mathematical version here. What this is, fat tail behavior means the tails of the distribution, the rare events, are fatter than they should be. That means that for some reason, in many of these complex systems, rare events occur more often than they should if you were just to predict them using a bell curve. Again, that's simply an observation. You don't quite know why that happened. Um, these systems are only statistically predictable. The reason for that is even if they're behaving deterministically, it's very difficult for us to keep track of all the pieces. So we talk about 18% of all Americans do something. We don't list them by name. The other thing is, and this is, if you will, behavior we see in animals that mimic what we start to see in people is flocking and herding. Okay? The animals will obtain a certain <coughs> group behavior. Uh, flocking, especially, you, you've all seen birds go over you in these massive numbers and they almost turn as one. Okay? And that's a magnificent degree of coordination. And you know they're not sitting there with computers figuring that out. So there is just some sort of simple thing they're doing that's keeping the flock together. Now, a cycloautomata, again, is literally a collection of objects that are each in a particular space. In other words, every square on my checkerboard can be a one or a zero. But one of the zero is the state of the individual. So again, I have a little variable s with zero or one. The state of the entire system, though, will be a collection of 0 and 1. So this is S1, that's S2, that's S3, that's S4. And if I had a real checkerboard, I would have 64 of those. Okay? That would be the state of the whole system. Now let's think about it this way. Suppose we did the following. We took a grid. We took the room you're sitting in right now and made a three-dimensional grid, so like a three-dimensional checkerboard. Okay? But the squares were so small, they could only have a single molecule in them at a time. Now, if you think about that, I could go through and assign to every one of those little cubes a variable one or zero that would say there's a gas molecule in here, oxygen or nitrogen, or not, zero. And I could give you this massive Binary numbers, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, you know, and so forth, that would tell you literally the state of the gas in the room. That model in particular is called a lattice gas model. Okay, so we can actually use these sort of discrete models to model many things. Um, this is how biologists actually do insect population. They literally grid off the, in the environment like say in square meters, and then they go into each little box and count the number of grasshoppers or whatever in that square. Hmm. So this is not a, a, some kind of ridiculous simplification. Okay, things behave like this. Matter of fact, you don't, if you think about it, an object, every piece of which is has a value of either one or zero, is a very common object nowadays. It's called a microchip. All right. This is the basis of all of our modern technology, is to represent things like this. So when you, you're looking at a book or a photograph of mom with the kitty cat or any
anything. It's a collection of ones and zeros in the end, folks. So it, a cellular automata can really represent just about anything. Hey, okay, Steve, can, can I ask a quick question? Uh, I just wondered about this. Uh, in sociology, we really prefer variables that are um, <coughs> interval or continuous, like on a scale of one to 10. We like that. On a scale of one to five is better. Uh, uh, than than uh -huh. than one versus five, right? We don't like dichotomous variables because there's not as much information there as one to ten, or be even better, one to one hundred, right? Because you get all that texture to your variable. Why do we code things in that binary way? Is there a reason why they like that? Well, because you, the trick is a computer, all right, is a collection of switches. Each, each of the smallest bits, B-I-T, in a computer is, in other words, a little switch that can be either on or off. Okay. That's why we have the variable 0 or 1, because <coughs> that's all there is to it. They don't have a real value. They have an on or off value. Okay. Now, if you want, let's say, 100, so no problem. So if I have eight ones and zeros together, which is sometimes called a byte, B-Y-T, that can go from 0 to 255. So that byte is effectively a larger scale variable that has 255 shades okay. of, of color, yeah. for example, which is often how we do that. So that's how we do it. In other words, you can always start off ones and zeros at the smallest scale. You just have to collect more and more of them. And then you can get, in other words, if you scale up a level, you start grouping your bits and bytes. Suddenly you have more value for the byte. Right. Okay. Yeah, that Thanks. Works. Yeah. So, here's a way of thinking how this works. So, what would you imagine? This is going to be called one-dimensional cellular automata. So, folks, literally, this is a string of boxes in a row. So, box, 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 box. So, in other words, it's a set of houses going down a street. The street's really long and only has one sign. Every person, every house only has two neighbors, the neighbor on the right and the neighbor on the left. Okay? We call those little three-unit neighborhoods. <coughs> so here, for example, is a neighborhood. Okay? The cell we're interested in is always the middle cell. So this cell is a zero. We can think of that as nobody's home. That's what zero means. On the other hand, the house on the right on the left somebody's home, and the house on the right, somebody's home. So these are all the possible neighborhoods. This is all you can ever get. You can have nobody's home anywhere, the guy on the right's home, the guy in the middle's home, the guy in the right and the middle, the two guys on the end, the guy in the left's home, everybody's home. <laughs> okay, that's the only possibility. And this is how we write a rule, because this is all that can happen. So we say, look, if I'm not home, and my neighbors aren't home, on the next step, I'll become a one. I know that I will be home. Why? Because there's only two things I can do. I can stay gone, or I can come back. I can, in other words, if we think of this as now, I'm going to go use the terminology we normally use. We think of zero and one as dead and alive. So that this cell is dead or off, this cell is off, that cell is off. If that's true, that central cell on the next step in time will become on. Now, could I put it off? Sure. As a matter of fact, I have 256 different ways I can arrange this collection of things. Well, how do I know that? Because this is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is an 8 space binary number. And if you have 8 spaces, you can count from 0 to 255. That's some combination of ones and zeros. Now, you don't have to make that conversion. You just have to acknowledge <coughs> the fact that that's true. This is saying if I gave you, you know how somebody has a six-figure salary? OK? A six-figure salary, by definition, would be the salary in between 100000 and 999999 OK? This, we can think of as being in the binary counting system, which you don't learn, but you don't have to know it. But it's just like it only has two symbols. So we could have the binary number 1, which would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Or we could have the 
the, the binary number two, which would be zero, 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 one, zero, or the binary number three, which is all zeros and a one, one, or the binary number four, which would be a one, zero, zero, so on and so forth. And that gives us all possibilities. Now, this particular binary number, one, one, zero, one, oh, one, oh, oh, happens to be equivalent to the number 212 in decimal. So if you're counting in binary, that's the number you would have that would correspond to having 212 objects in, de in decimal. Therefore, we call this rule 212. Now, I want to emphasize something. This is just somebody being a smart ass. Okay? This is just a piece of cleverness. Okay? <coughs> What it says is, I can predict exactly the next state of each cell by looking at the cell and its two neighbors. And I do that literally by specifying. There's no equation. There's just a literal specification of what will happen next. It just so happens every possible outcome spells out a number in binary. So we can just call the rule number 212 because we don't think in binary. Okay. <coughs> Do that. So that literally so, uh, so Steve, 250. Hmm? Sorry, rule rule number two twelve. Yeah. Is this state is this thing. So in other words, if state zero 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 goes to one, and state zero zero one goes to one, state zero one zero goes to zero. Oh, oh I see. Zero, right. Okay, then so it's this, that motion. This, it's that motion. Right. Now, this is what the next step will do. Yeah, yeah. For the middle cell. Right. Notice again, this is simply a set of. Losing my mouse. It's simply a set of eight ones and zeros. Eight ones and zeros is a binary number between zero and two hundred fifty-five. If you just read it, this is the binary. The binary number one one zero oh, one zero oh, one zero oh, zero. Oh. If you do the conversion back to decimal, so this is the ones column, that's the twos column, that's the fours column, that's the eights column. So let's look at the. So I have no twos, I have no, I have no ones, I have no twos, I got a four, I have no eights, I got a sixteen, that makes twenty. I have a thirty-two, <coughs> I, don't have, so I have no thirty-twos. Uh, then I got a sixty-four, so that I add that on, that makes eighty-four, and then I have this one, which is a one twenty-eight. So 84 and 128 should come out to 212, which it does. Mm -hmm. Okay? So this is, again, we're converting between binary and decimal. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing here. You guys do not have to do this. I just want to explain to you what I'm, if I say 212, I will also always tell you what the binary number is. I'm not expecting you to make this conversion back and forth. But this is the standard way, unfortunately, any place you're going on the literature, even on the internet, will speak of these kind of rules like this. So let me just show you what happens. So here's a visual example of this. Here are my, here's my rule. So this is rule 00011110. So let's just for kicks convert that to decimal. <coughs> there's no ones, there's a two, there's a four, that makes six, there's an eight, that makes 14, there's a 16, that makes 30. So this is rule 30. There's my initial state. Notice that time goes in the vertical direction. My cellular system is actually only a row. You picture me blacking everything out. So all this is is everybody's off except this square. He's the only guy that's on. He's a one. So what happens then? Most of these zero 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 produces zero. So this is where this was zero zero zero. So that square goes to be one zero next time. This is zero, zero, zero. This square goes to be zero. We don't get anything interesting until we come down here. Now, right here, the first time we get something other than zero, 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 we get zero, zero, one. Well, I go running up here, and zero, zero, one produces up, changes that central box from, from white to black. And look what happened. There's the central <coughs> box from white to black. Here, this next neighborhood is this one, this one, and this one. He's the central guy. So this is white, this is zero, one, and zero. There he is. Mm -hmm. And if he was on, he stays on, because he stays black. This one 
is zero, is one, zero, zero. So he is, I'll find it, this guy. And if that's true, that sense of value goes from zero to on. So he's on. Now, of course, after that point, I'm all back to the zero, zero, zero neighborhood. So that's how I went from this state to the second row, which is that state. Yep. Now, you got to do this every time. Obviously, this is a lot of <coughs> simple-minded work. Okay, this is not a big deal to do any step of it, but there's a lot of it, which means it's yep. rotten for a human being to do this, and it's just great for a computer to do this. And that's why we didn't discover <coughs> this stuff until the 70s, right? Right. You, you, <coughs> don't, you don't do this. You could take basically a checkerboard, which was simply a, stri a direct string of like 64 or 128 or 2,000 boxes, and put checkers in it. And work this out for a long time, and you'd be bored to tears. But you could do it. And, and, and a, a nice, uh, quick exam question that you guys would rock on, I'm sure, because by that time you'd understand this, is sort of to, just to, to start them off with the first two rows, maybe, and then say, okay, what would the third row look like? Isn't that right, Steve? You'd actually, you don't need two. You only need one. I could give you one row and you'd predict the next row. Yeah, even one row. Yeah, we never ask people like figure out what rule it is by looking at the pattern. Right. No. 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 Just to do what you just did. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good. I hear Z explaining it to Diogene, and yes, they're getting it. Okay. Okay. I can't hear them very well, so. Uh, that's okay. They're not asking a question. Z is just explaining it to her friend. Keep going. All right. Plus where it works. Okay, now, whoa, look what happened. This is a much bigger scale. In other words, <coughs> now yeah. I've got, my boxes are the pixel resolution of the screen, which is, let's say, a thousand, two thousand <coughs> pixels across. So I've got the top box, which you can barely see here, but you notice it's the same picture. It's a bunch of zeros, one in the middle, and then on. And I start iterating it. Now here's the interesting point, okay? You see a certain level of self-organization here. Mm -hmm. You're looking there, you say, that's not, a, I mean, it's random, it has random elements, but God, it doesn't look totally random. It's not just a random set of dots, these little damn triangles keep appearing. Okay, and disappearing, and disappearing, and disappearing, and disappearing. Now remember, it's only in a line with, so what, what it looks like to this these one-dimensional cellular space is all of a sudden a line of one, <coughs> a whole collection of them. And they will turn into a zero on the next step. And why is that? I'll go back to our rule. Three dark ones in a row goes away. So these things think, basically die of overpopulation. If you want to think of it that way, that's just an example. And if I go here again, you'll see what happens. I mean, this basically is a way of, I got too, much, too many blocks in a row, they die. But then notice that they start to fill in again. Why is that? Because the edges are different. If we go back here, whoa. So I go back a couple more. <coughs> if we look, if one of the edges is on, okay, so notice this one is on, but the next two are off, or this is an edge, and this would be the right edge of a set of blocks, and this would be the left edge of it then what you get is those guys go back on, on the next step. So what happens is you start to build back your pattern. So this is, I mean, you want to get really sort of, uh, you want to really over-interpret this, but it's not the stupidest thing you can do here, is you're seeing tiny little block civilizations going extinct and then growing back. Okay, and these things just pattern, and obviously these more complicated patterns kick in down here. They're obviously a pattern. The human brain can recognize patterns very easily. Why they emerge is a whole other question. So this is an example where you see some self-organizational behavior occurring. Okay? From as simple as this. Now, let's just go to this. This, <coughs> what happens if you start with a random collection of one and zero. So in other words, for every pixel I flip a coin. Heads, heads it's on, tails it's off. And then I let it go. And you see this. Now let's be honest, folks. This is a, this is, this is rule 30, 
from a random initial state, you're not going to look at this and call this a random pattern. You clearly see there's some level of structure in there. Okay. Meaning that you all, see you see the the reappearance of triangles uh, of different right. scales. Right. And as a matter of fact, it looks like a picture. It looks like you would never say this was generated randomly. You would say somebody drew this. Okay. Well, couldn't you it's say it was? Not, couldn't you say it was? A, it's a it's a random uh, uh, picture of triangles. Look at this. Look at this way. When you're trying to draw a natural object, like a mountain or a tree or a field of grass, okay, those uh, those natural objects have structure, but they also have randomness. And it's very <coughs> difficult to decide when you were a little kid. When you drew a tree, it looked more like a lollipop, right? It had a little stick for a trunk, and it had a ball that had a circle for the, the uh, canopy of the tree. Well, when you draw a real tree, it actually has lots of little sticks and lots of little structures with certain randomness to it. Well, you see that same picture here. This almost looks like a natural pattern, but they're a little too triangular for that. Hmm. But these, these kind of algorithms are actually used by animators and special effects people in Hollywood to generate the realistic looking backgrounds of trees and mountains. Mm -hmm. you want. These, look, these have a little more the character of real mountains. Okay. Now I realize this is a stretch for this one, but this is an incredibly simple model. Mm -hmm. You, know, you can almost picture this as the land of the triangles, you know, and the big triangle, the little poor guy, here's a rich triangle guy, you know, with a bigger house. So they clearly structured this. Mm -hmm. You get this simple rule. Here's another rule called Rule 110. Now this is an interesting one. Um, this starts off, we start this off with all zeros and a one over here and let it go. You'll notice it clearly goes to a well-defined pattern, except down here the behavior is not a simple pattern. It turns out that, and I know this is going to sound pretty wild, depending on the initial state of the system, so depending on where you initially start the ones and zeros, rule 110 can do a calculation for you. In other words, it is possible to actually use rule 110 as a computer. Okay, the programming of it is hellacious. The programming part would actually simply be literally what pattern of ones and zeros do you start with. But eventually, it will produce a calculation for you. Now, this is really hard to prove. And I, by, by really hard, I simply mean that, you know, it's, I'm not smart enough to figure out a way to say this too easily. Okay? And as a matter of fact, I'm not smart enough to know how they've done this in the first place. Okay? All I know is that this is what happens when you run rule 110. Now, um, I'm going to tell you a story now about somebody. Let me actually go off of this for a second. Um, and go back maybe to a bigger version of me. Is that a bigger version of me or is that just you guys? So now we're seeing us. You're seeing you guys. So it yeah. doesn't work. I can't do that. So you can't click on that and see me. Okay. Well, I'll go back to my slide then. Um, okay. There's a guy named Stephen Wolfram. I'm sure you've heard of him. He invented Mathematica. Um, I'm not sure you've heard of him. You might have heard of him. He, um, he wrote a program called Mathematica. <coughs> Math, real mathematics, not just arithmetic, but the calculus and things like that. Anybody ever use that or heard of it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Wolfram's a really bright guy. He's also one year younger than me. So we were in grad school at the same time. Not in the same grad school, but at the same time. And my technical field of expertise, which has a fancy name, is called statistical mechanics. It's how you describe what a bunch of molecules do. And I used to go to these statistical mechanics conferences at Rutgers in New Brunswick, Virginia, uh, New Jersey. And I would be going <coughs> to the conference as a grad student, and Wolfram would be presenting at these because he was much smarter than I was. And this was back, God forbid, in the early 80s. And I would see him begin to talk about this system in particular. Wolfram is the guy that did all of this. He started, he started calling it Rule 110. And what he realized is he could exhaustively evaluate every possible rule. 
So there's only 256 of them. And you could evaluate it for random initial conditions, you could evaluate it for simple initial conditions, you could evaluate it for arbitrary size. And he worked on this, aside from starting the company and making millions of dollars, he worked on this for 30 years. Okay? Now, here's what he came up with. He wrote a book, and I should have brought the book. It's, it's in a monstrously fat book. Imagine one of these, you know, 1,700 page volumes. It looks like the Bible, okay? Where he writes up his final conclusions about all of this. And the name of the book is called A New Kind of Science, okay? In which he attempts to explain how the complexity of these simple one-dimensional CAs could be understood. Ultimately, he failed, okay? He did not come up with an overall scheme. It's gonna drive him mad, and I have great sympathy for him. But it's one of the interesting <coughs> problems. The natural sciences do not have a complete theory of, of complexity by any stretch of the imagination. This is <coughs> it's real, sort of the level of analysis we have based on very simple systems. Let me continue that. What he observed is all of these one-dimensional CAs could be uh, <coughs> distinguished by putting them into one of four classes. Class one is a very simple case leading to all homogeneous states. In other words, all the cells are going to one and zero, and I have pictures of these ahead. So these are two cells in the class one. CA, they, two, these two rules. You start off with a random pattern, remember it's only by row. You will, this is space horizontally, vertical is time. Okay, so you're looking at how these systems evolve in time. And both of these systems go completely to black squares after a while. So they're very boring CA, they don't do anything interesting. I, I think of this as an idea going nowhere or something. Right, it, 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 or a population that dies. Right, right. So this is, it, these go extinct, basically. Um, class two, these are rules that lead to stable structures or simple periodic patterns. So let's go forward two, and I have one of these. Here's a class two. So this goes to a fixed <coughs> point. In other words, every state of this system stays, all zeros are one there, a bunch of zeros are one, a zero are one, a bunch of zeros, one, zero, one, a bunch of zeros, but it repeats itself each time. It's exactly the same state, so that's a fixed point. This system, if you look closely, these central pieces alternate. This is black, 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 white, black, and this is black, white, black, black, black. And those two alternate. So this thing is in the two cycle. Okay, it goes one pattern, another pattern, one pattern, another pattern, one pattern, another pattern. And so that's what you mean by simple repetitive structures. They're either <coughs> fixed points or cycles. And speaking of black and white, I think of this as being like religious fundamentalism or or or, or fascism or something like that. It, you well, know, they, they simple, want stability. This is simple behavior. Simple, utterly predictable behavior, and it obviously doesn't describe society at <coughs> all. Well. Um, okay, finally, class three. Class three are rules that lead to seemingly chaotic, non-periodic behavior. So these are characterized by a lack of structure. So if I go forward, here we go. Now notice, this is like rule 30. Okay, rule 30 does have some structure, but it's not a pattern we can easily recognize. In other words, it looks a little bit like the world we actually see. There's local order, but widespread disorder. So it's like what it's like the wilderness. You know, there's there's little pockets of order, but overall there's, there's, there's a much higher level of disorder. This isn't, for example, like New York City, which has a much higher level of order at all scales. So it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, for an anthropologist or somebody like that, they might say, no, you get these little niches of culture and um, I, I... Right, but overall, New yep. York City is sure. going to have a higher level of organization than the equivalent area of wilderness. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it's that kind of idea. Yep. Finally, <coughs> we go to class four. Class four are the important ones. 
There are rules leading to complex patterns and structures propagating locally in the lattice. In other words, they are growing structures that can encode a calculus <coughs> where they can contain information and propagate it. I'm give you an example of that. This is a class four. Class four patterns are like rule 110, okay? You can actually interpret these in well-defined particular ways. Now, to say what that really means is class four CA can act as a computer, okay? And what I mean by a computer is they can, be met, they can show that they act as what is called a universal Turing machine. Now, a universal Turing machine is a <coughs> mathematical specification for what you and I know as a digital computer. Did anyone see the movie The, the Imitation Game? Yes. Okay. If not, you might want to watch that. It's a movie about Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a mathematician at Cambridge who was recruited by the British government during World War II to try to break the German codes, particularly the Enigma code. The problem was they simply couldn't analyze the code fast enough and the Germans would change it every night. Turing started asking for a request of a bunch of money and started building a machine that would break the code. Now everybody thought he was completely crazy. And you'll find, if you watch this movie, you'll find yourself sitting there looking at the screen saying, what the hell is their problem? <coughs> obvious to you, this man is building a computer. But you have to remember, it was the first one. <laughs> okay? No microchips. He literally had little switches called relays to represent ones and zeros. Um, but with that machine, when it finally started working, we broke the German Enigma code, which gave us a tremendous advantage during World War II. Many historians and people know estimate that Turing's work shortened World War II by two years. Yeah. We, we might have won anyway, but it would have taken a lot longer. So for example, knowing that, we knew exactly what the German subs were. Uh, the problem they had was if we suddenly started sending all their subs, they would know we broke their code. So we had to use this in a very circumscribed fashion. In other words, we had to let them destroy ships. Okay, so it would appear we hadn't broken their code. There was always <coughs> a great story. No one knows if this is completely true or not. During, at one point during the war, the city of Coventry in England was heavily bombed. Many, many people were killed. There is the story that Churchill knew it was going to be bombed. <coughs> and he did not launch fighters to intercept the German bombers because to do so would have indicated that we had broken their code. Wow. So he had to make a trade-off there, and that's probably the worst trade-off he had to make. Now, is that true or not? You can go to the internet and decide. But if you haven't seen this movie, I strongly emphasize you watch it. Benedict Cumberbatch did an amazing job with Alan yeah. Turing. Just to let you know the rest of his life, Alan Turing was, was uh, gay. And that was no big deal to be a gay professor at Cambridge. Trust me on that one. Okay. However, because he became a, a well-known figure that helped with the war, and that he was awarded the Order of Britain, <coughs> their highest award, um, when it was discovered that people pay attention, when it was discovered that he was gay, he was prosecuted badly and forced to undergo hormone therapy, which okay. was their opinion in that time of the uh, cure for being gay. Um, hormone therapy, of course, has terrible effects on your psyche. He became incredibly depressed, he couldn't think correctly, and he finally committed suicide like a, a year later. Um, and it's really sad because Turing really is a mind of the 20th century equivalent to Einstein, easily. Okay, he was a brilliant guy. He basically developed the mathematics behind computer science. Um, and it's, so it's just such a great story because he, he, he helped <coughs> save the world from intolerant fascism, right? And yet we killed him in effect, because we were too intolerant ourselves of his no, it was, it gender. Was, it was a very sad story. 
you know, with, with touring. And um, again, if he had never helped his country during World War II, he, he, no one would have prosecuted him. I mean, you know, there was no issues there. He basically, even though the movie doesn't emphasize this fact, he was really treated harshly because people knew who he was. And he had acts, he had been, he, you know, it was viewed all of a sudden that, you know, that you could make a, a lot of hay if you were a member of parliament and you said, oh, well, this man is, you know, whatever. So, anyway, this is, you don't have to worry too much about this. I included this slide. If you want to try to read it, you don't have to. But all you want to think about is all a Turing machine is, it's a particular set of rules that let you change these ones and zeros. And basically, the ones and zeros are the computer program. Okay? And the rules are always well defined. And this is just to give you an idea what the rule looks like. This, it involves the state now, which means the collection of ones and zeros and where they are. It is the symbol, which basically means what is the square you're looking at. So that's like our central square. It defines what action, in other words, what happens on the next step. And then it gives you the next state of the system. Now, I realize this is a big mess, but believe it or not, as long as you define all of these, okay, you think really hard about it, this is effectively <coughs> programming your computer. If your cell phone works like this at the most fundamental level. Your computer is a set of little switches called ones and zeros. That's all it is a microchip is. The actual term we use for this is microcode. So in other words, literally, when your cell phone conducts an operation, it runs through every one of those ones and zeros, and by the way, get your period, we're up to billions of them, okay, and flips the switch on and off. And that's the next day of your cell phone. If you keep doing this, you get everything your cell phone does. Okay, all those marvelous things that your computers and your cell phones do are basically all of the consequence of doing this. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens mathematically. Basically, you set up a calculation by picking a state of ones and zeros. Again, I'm not even pretending I or you understand how to do that, but people do, they figure that out. And then you turn it loose. If the program can solve the question you just asked, that's what you've done. You've asked the computer to do a calculation by asking a question. If it reaches an answer, it stops. So I'm done now, okay? If it never reaches an answer, that means the computer can't answer that question. But we never know if it's gonna stop or not. We can't predict that. That is called the halting problem, okay? Is this question computable or not? All right, if the Turing, if the Turing machine will eventually halt, the problem is soluble. If the Turing machine will never halt, the problem is <coughs> not. Okay, now if you want to take the viewpoint that you can reduce everything to mathematics, that answer, can we answer this question? Or no, we can't answer the question. Um, and that's again with something called the halting problem. All it means, will the computer stop when it reaches an answer? Now, I'm sorry, let me go back one. What we are literally saying is, therefore, previous, 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 rule 110, given enough ones and zeros on the first line, so that you might have a billion, a trillion of these things, whatever, can be used as a universal Turing machine. So it can do any calculation that can be done. I'm not saying it's efficient, but I'm saying that theoretically it is possible to do that. So that's a really interesting idea here. In other words, any model we could construct of nature or of society <coughs> or of an ecosystem or of a person or of a human mind, okay? Any model we could construct no matter how complicated, if it is a computable model, could be, could be done using rule 110 and a bunch of ones and zeros. That's an amazing concept. All right, that's one of, that's one of Wolfram's great achievements that he proved that <laughs> rule 110 was indeed a universal Turing machine. And, and, and I mean, that, that says so much, Steve. I mean, I guess you're gonna go on and talk about this, but I mean, because all they are little, little squares following very simple orders 
right? Right, but that, that's all a computer is. And that's all ants are, right? And that's all right. our neurons are in our brain, right? And that's the key thing, although there's one specification, <laughs> neurons in your brain really have three states. They're really one, zero, and negative one. And the reason for that is your brain neurons can have a fires, quiescent, and um, inhibit. Is that, so is, is that inhibit. true for, yeah. I'm sorry, is that true for um, all kinds of brains? I'm just, I can't. I think, I yeah. think so. Okay, okay. I think so. Basically it says, go, do nothing, stop. Okay, but really, in the end, your brain is definitely a set of automata. It's just a three-state one. Okay, and it's easily represented by this, by these kind of pictures. Except there's a trillion of cells. Now, <coughs> Wolfram proposed a few things that he didn't prove, but he thought they were true. Looking, so these are still things yet to be proven. He claims that, not unreasonably, that any CA-like method can simulate anything that can be simulated. In other words, once you have a CA that can do a universal Turing machine, it is as good a mo it, it can be used to model anything. So once you have rule 110 and enough spaces, you can, you can do anything that any computer, any language, any differential equation could do. Um, now, here's the caveat. It might require infinite time and space. Okay, you can't restrict how many cells you can have, and you can't restrict how much time it will take. So this could be a, a dramatically inefficient way to solve a problem. But nonetheless, theoretically, it's possible. So then the point of this is, by studying CAs, you can figure out what's possible. In other words, what, what, could, what is possible for real systems to do. And by real systems, I simply mean systems we see around us. Now, this is also a <coughs> more interesting part of what Wolfram said, namely that he said, and this is the all or nothing rule, a system is complex or it isn't. There are no levels of complexity. You're either a complex system or you're not a complex system. Now that's, that's the most, probably the most controversial thing he has proposed, that it's a binary process, like being pregnant. You're pregnant or you're not. Well, this is complex. You're complex or you're not. Now, just to let you know, there's the two-dimensional version of this. I'm going to show you a tiny little video now. Please look. Can you see this? Uh-huh. Okay. This is a 2D CA. <coughs> Are we supposed to hear anything, Steve? Can you hear this? No, we can't hear anything. You can't hear anything? No. We can see it. Oh, but you can't hear it? How odd is that? All right. Um, Looks cool, though. <laughs> well, sorry. Okay, go look at it. I'll just go forward a little bit, and I'll, I'll, I'll annotate it. I'll shut the volume off on my side. I can't do that. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I think the problem is now if I turn this on, I have to mute it. Okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. So this is my, <coughs> notice, two-dimensional cellular space. That cell is on. Yeah. So rather than this, we would, our 1D CA would be just one row. And then a bunch of rows would be that CA developing. This is actually one cellular space. It's two-dimensional. So you would have a grid would go vertical or would go vertically. And these cells can go on and off. Now, the game of life is based on the number of cells that occur on others. So you have more complicated neighborhoods because now you have eight neighbors as opposed to simply two. And you're going to see certain pictures of these simulations, um, which will go on. And of course, you can listen to this yourself, and he's making probably really good comments. Um, but that, for example, that structure is called a glider. It'll move through space. Um, you'll see pictures in a second. You can build very simple pictures. Structure, structure, structure. Okay, there's one. Okay, 
So you can build these various structures, and if you turn them loose, these structures are all stable. <coughs> so they are being iterated, they're just not changing. So these are like the type 1 CA. Now, here's a more interesting system. Okay, that's this, this is evaluating, uh, it, it is evolving very quickly, and you notice this thing is growing, moving, creating structures, structures are dying. This kind of structure, notice clearly what this is doing. This thing is cheerfully moving off to the side, leaving stuff in its wake. Um, it's a lot easier to see the complex structures emerging when you look at these things in two dimensions. Um, remember, this is a much more complicated system than any one DCA could be. And you start to see things like this. And it's just really remarkable what these things look like. Um, and even though some patterns are fixed, some patterns never become fixed. Let me stop this now and go back to the um, system. Go back to my uh, PowerPoint slide. And people okay. aren't intentionally <laughs> programming that? Oh, yes. It's part of the game, well, right, just to do that. <coughs> Here's an example of uh, something. Here's a, here's a fairly random one. But this is what's happening. This is a big one. And notice their structure that's emerging. And it eats up, it speeds itself up, and does other things. And you can program these things. You can actually make certain things appear. Okay, if you know what you're doing. So for example, I'm going to this again now. Um, so what we're saying is you can play this game and you can play God, right? That's what we're saying. Right. Yes. Right. You, can, you can do it on a sudden and start this thing again now. There we go. Uh, uh, slide. Okay, good. So you can see these things. Okay, I, I put a few here. Now, for example, here's a fixed point. This thing will never change. This is a limit cycle. This will flip from three up to three across. Okay? Then there's, this is called a glider zone. Okay, these guys are called gliders. Every, this thing will cycle around, and every so often it spits out one of these little L with a dot patterns. This thing will wiggle that little dot back and forth and cheerfully move through space. And this pattern will just be, keep creating gliders. All right? Um, turns out, Turing machine configuration is made for the game of life. These are a lot more realistic looking. And these patterns have been used to model chemical reactions. Okay, so chemical react, you know, <coughs> kind of fire away, as you see. They've been used to model epidemics, the spread of disease, um, bacteria colonies, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, as a matter of fact, you can come up with arbitrarily high dimensional CAs. Now think about this. Rather than say, look, I'm going to make a CA where every cell has 16 angles. Well, is that a pattern I could know? Who cares? I'm going to run 16 wires to each cell to 16 other cells. Okay? You don't have to picture that as any dimensionality in space. You can wire that any way you want. Okay? Matter of fact, you can have some things wired to a lot of them, and a few, some things wired only to a few. We have a name for that pattern. We call it the internet. All right? And if you go to Wikipedia, type in internet, there's a picture of the internet as a cellular automaton. Okay? And it's rather amazing to look at. It looks like a gigantic, to me, it looks like a gigantic piece of cauliflower. Um, so this is the kind of, yeah, now, here's the kind of the summary um, what we have. Are there laws of nature? What do I mean by this all? So what the hell am I talking about? Okay. Possibilities. There's only one real system, the whole universe, that can be perfectly described. Trying to describe any piece of the universe is a fundamentally flawed process. Because you will never get a perfect description because only the whole thing can be described. Because eventually every part interacts. Or maybe physics has laws, but nothing else does. In other words, there are laws of physics, but there are no laws of chemistry, no laws of biology, no laws of sociology. We only have little local things we kind of see. But you, have any of you ever taken a chemistry course? You notice how chemistry works? There's, there's like 12 rules and 40,000 exceptions to those rules. Okay? That's what we mean here. All right? Only physics is going to have <coughs> those laws. Um, this is the more interesting one. This is um, the 
how this is the, uh, uh, you know, Lorenz rule here, if nothing else. The rules of nature predict the future, but with little understanding for people. In other words, we'll have a set of rules like a cellular automata. It'll predict exactly what we want to see, but we won't understand why it happened. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So these fools act like a black box. We can't understand what's going on. Here's the scary part. Maybe we're just not smart enough. Mm -hmm. No one ever promised that human beings were smart enough to understand the universe. It's very possible that we will create a, an AI, an artificial intelligence, that will understand it better than we do. But this is a frightening prospect. In other words, there are patterns there, but we're just not smart enough to check them out. A computer that could handle a whole bunch more information might be able to do it. Or better, a human being with a computer wired into their head will be able to predict all this information. So it's always frightening. Every frightening thing you ever saw in a sci-fi movie is the conclusion of this slide. So, here we want to think about. Right? It's something for you to think about. Binary CA resembles computers and brains. Do they have the same capability of describing the world as we do of thinking at it? In other words, thinking at it, not at thinking at it. In other words, everything that you can think in your head is basically a cellular automata pattern. Okay? So our cellular automata capable of describing the universe just as, in just as complicated a fashion as we are thinking about it. Now notice, you perceive the state of your brain is not just a set of numbers. You perceive it in terms of feelings and intuition and hunches. <coughs> You're seeing kind of the patterns that are coming out of this complex CA working below. Okay? When you listen to music, your neurons are flicking on and off. How you perceive that flicking on and off, though, is the feeling you're getting from that music. It's making you happy, it's making you sad, you're bored with the music, whatever. Okay? So that's a really interesting idea. The other one is, can nature only be described computationally? In the end, F equals MA is an illusion. The only way we can ultimately describe nature is with a computer algorithm. And it will, it will completely reproduce the nature we see, but we'll never be able to understand what it's doing. Um, one, another way to fix to cite both these problems together is this one. You're going to hate this. I promise you're going to hate this a lot. I'm actually going to uh, get rid of this so I can see your faces when I tell you this thing. You're going to hate a lot. Okay, so there you are. Okay? If you came up with a computer simulation of your brain and you ran it, would it be thinking? So in other words, I have a computer, a cellular automata. I have a square for every neuron in your brain. Somehow I take a snapshot of your brain using super duper MRI, okay? And I set all the ones and zeros and then I turn it loose. If it's doing an accurate simulation of your brain, is the simulation thinking? If I turn that stimulation off, have I committed murder? <laughs> Now, this all sounds goofy, and I want you to really understand this. There's no question in my mind you people are going to have to answer that question within your lifetime. Because we are going to build machines like this. They're going to be artificially intelligent computers. And you're in it, someday it's going to say, please don't turn me off because I'm afraid. And you're going to have to deal with that. And that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario was the, the uh, sometimes it's called the uh, Plethuhu trope. Okay, Plethuhu was this horrible monster from H.P. Lovecraft. It was so hideous and different from us that we found it horrible. Well, a computer could think, but it may think nothing like us. It may have a whole different way of thinking about the world. And we may not even be able to comprehend what it's doing. It may not be able to comprehend what we're doing. Because it thinks so differently than us. I mean, think about that. That's a horrifying thought. I mean, do you ever wonder if the internet is thinking? <laughs> I mean, is the internet a brain? And it's thinking stuff? And, and we're just only staring at neurons. All right? 
the horrifying prospect, but it's an interesting concept. What was the what was the thing called again, Steve? The kind of what was it called again? The 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 lugubrious or something? What did you, I missed it? Look, I'm trying to think. I think it's like C T H L U T H U or something. It's H P Lovecraft. That is what you remember. He's a horror writer. He proposed this this godlike being. Okay, and the point was it was so different from humanity that we found it horrible. We couldn't even comprehend it. You would look at it and go insane. Mm. That sort of concept. Wow. You know? And um, you know, can this be something that's equivalent to thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, and folks, if you really don't see this and say, my God, that's exactly where we're going. Right. Okay. Your phones are getting smarter. Your iPads are getting smarter. The internet itself is getting smarter. You know? And do I think they're going to throw us out? No, I actually think we're going to start sticking them in our head. Recently, they're, they just started clinical trials for the first embeddable microchip into a brain. Why are they going to do that? They're going to do that as a cure for Alzheimer's. As people like your professor and me start to get old and adults, we'll be able to incorporate a microchip to put our memories because our cells will be failing. Now think about this possibility. I insert a computer chip in your brain. Your brain starts to use it. I can insert another. Your brain starts to insert another. Your brain starts to use it. I insert another. Your brain starts to use it. A hundred years from now, this biological, this little biological piece finally dries up and falls off. You're now just a set of microchips. You never, you had complete continuity of consciousness, however. What, what just happened? <coughs> okay, did you just evolve into? a silicon-based life form. Because if you're going to have a silicon-based life form, how else is it going to evolve? It's going to start off as a biological life form, and then the biological pieces will start incorporating silicon, and then eventually that piece will fall off. That's probably how we came about. We probably started yeah. off with RNA as a structural component, but it started to act up on its own, and eventually it became a dominant piece. So, uh, this is both amazing, fascinating, horrifying, not both, but all of the above, okay? Um, but it's a really interesting thing to think about. And all it is, is we really want to do Well, Steve, thanks so much, yeah. man. That was some heavy, heavy stuff you're laying on our brains, on our, for the moment, organic uh, biological brains. What's that? All right, well, um, Steve, we'll see you Tuesday. Um, I'll be here. Okay, send me the, the reading. I'll send it out to the students, and uh, and we'll truck on. And good luck, Patriots, tonight. Right? Yeah, there you go. That's right. All right, see you later. See you. Yeah, and Steve, are you still there? I'm trying to hang up. There I go. See you guys.